I think taking oneself seriously is, is the worst Sin. attribute anybody can have. And I think it also makes life so much duller. Hello, and welcome to the third act. I'm Catherine Fairweather. It's a joy to welcome Theo Fennell, the UK's leading silver designer and effervescent rock star jeweller, who has recently written a hilarious, life affirming memoir. It is as sparkling with wit as the diamonds of his signature skull rings and charms. I'm delighted that he's agreed to drop round from his neighbouring store in Chelsea and shoot the breeze with me at Orion's. It's wonderful to see you. Um, three score and ten, I think. That's the optimum lifespan of man, according yep. to the Bible, isn't it? So here it you is. are, sitting at 70 years old, looking incredibly youthful. Well, I'm on borrowed time. I'm aware of that. My father died at 60, quite suddenly. So I'm 10 years into a sort of holiday period. So everything's and a bonus. You wake up every morning thinking, hooray, another I day. I do pretty much. Yeah. I do pretty much. I think, think the, fun enough, the other sort of epitaph when we were talking about these things, I thought I was never let the old man in. And I think it's incredibly important for people as they reach their autumn years or even late autumn years to still be interested and still try to be interesting and, you know, take up new things, look at new things yeah. and never let the old man in or the old woman in, depending. Yeah, obviously. to think young, basically. Yeah, I think so. I think, but, but, but specifically not to think old. I've never been to any kind of reunion, school reunion of any sort. But a couple of years ago, a friend of mine said, we should go to the 50th anniversary of when we left school. And he said if only for anthropological reasons, see what's happened to people and see, you know, what's come of them. And we all had to wear badges with our names on them, which was just as well because you one couldn't recognise recognize anybody, no. And when I arrived, I, I was actually late for chapel. We were having uh, a, a little service before dinner. And I arrived late and with a vape. And I was told by a man in a gown age 68, which is where I was, you're late, firstly, and put that thing away. And it was like going back 50 years, and I realised that I was still, you know, hadn't changed really since then. And I walked into what I thought was, you know, sort of God's waiting room. I literally surrounded by people I didn't recognise at all, all of whom I thought must have been masters when I was there, mm. who sort of stayed on and were 50 years older except for a few people I knew and see a lot of anyway. But it's like children. If you don't see them for six months, they suddenly, you know, they look a foot taller. And amongst the people there, there was, there was a huge distinction between the ones who obviously still had some sort of both physical and intellectual vanity left. They were still trying to at least, you know, get up and, face the day and enjoy themselves and learn new things and whatever. And those that had all but given up. And one of them said to me that he was busier than he'd ever been before. He looked unbelievably old. I and mean, he really did look like Methuselah. And I thought, poor old thing. I'll go up and have a word with him. Hello. And I said, what do you do? He said, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm a secretary of the Old Boys Five Society. <laughs> <I'm wonderful. laughs> Which kept him nose to the grindstone. But then there were other people there who were still working, who were still you know, going out, who were still interested in new music and what have you and those things. And physically, mm. they looked totally different. Mm. It's being plugged in and being engaged, isn't it? Yeah. With other generations as well. Exactly. And they were the ones that were seeing their children and their grandchildren and were sort of, you know, you know, in, in a nice way, mm. just sporting with younger people. Mm. And, um, and physically, you, I mean, you gave up drinking 23 years ago, didn't 20, you? Yes, for and the smoking? millennium. And smoking? Did you give up smoking? Yeah. You have your vape. But... Yeah, occasional vape. Non, I try to do non, whatever it's called, tobacco vape. Mm -hmm. um, so I vape bananas uh, and occasional lychee <laughs> on, on high days and holidays. So let's, as you say, it's been a seismic year for you. You've uh, produced or written this incredible book, <laughs> I Fear for This Boy, in lockdown, in competition with your family, I think who were all busy writing, weren't they, at mm. the time? Your rather brilliant family, all of them, one more successful than Annoyingly, the other. Annoyingly, yes. Do you, are you now known as um, Emerald's father? 
Oh, Lord, yes. I've been known as that since almost she was born. I mean, she came out of the womb singing, you know, something. She was always going to be a sort of performer of some sort, yeah. Yes, it would, we were in lockdown. As chance would have it, she and her husband and her then tiny son were in England from Los Angeles with us. And lockdown came and we were, you know, quartered together with her sister, all of us, which couldn't have been nicer. And it was, you know, I feel incredibly guilty in many ways, but it was like a sort of endless Edwardian summer. And so everyone was working. I was trying to keep the business going, sort of in Zoom meetings. And, and it, as it turned out, talking to my clients much more than I normally would. But I'd, at lunchtime, there'd be this sort of conversation about how their script was going, book was going. And I was sort of, had a few designs and I did a little sort of a book of, of, of jewellery that I'd done with drawings. And then I put quotes underneath. So it might be, you know, a bit of Keats, whatever, if I'd made a nightingale, <laughs> whatever it was. And they said it didn't really count as writing because it was somebody else's writing. But it counted as drawing. I realised I wasn't a writer. And it was like being at Charleston and being sort of, you know, Virginia Woolf's friend who didn't really write, but sort of came for lunch. So I thought I'd start writing. And I started a novel, which is really difficult. Mm. I mean, it really is difficult. And I hadn't realised about things like timelines and mm. got slightly confusing in that, you know, suddenly I realised that the father of my hero was only six when he had him. You know, and I had to go right back to the beginning. I thought, this is hopeless. And I talked to a friend of mine who does write and, and writes very well. He said, just write down what you know. Mm. And I'd always thought that I wish my father had written down some of the things because his letters to me were always very funny and he was a very good storyteller, yeah. a very good raconteur. But he never wrote them down and I thought, you know, I wish he had, even just the sort of the silliest of them. So I thought I would do that. And I wrote two or three pretty obvious ones and then showed them to Louise, my wife, who was a really savage editor Lines went through saying, pompous ass, you know, nobody's interested. No one's used this word for 50 years. I mean, all that sort of stuff. And she was absolutely right. So I, I sort of took out the, the boring bits, I thought, and modified the language to be a little bit more sort of, well, a little bit more the spoken word and mm. contemporary than, than it had been. And the deal was that I could write really about anything, but no famous people. Yes. Because I just don't think famous people are funny. And that was one. The second was no sex, because I knew that my daughters would be so horrified by any mention of, you know, sort of old dad sex, which, I mean, I would have been if my father had yeah. been. I would have been cringing with yes, embarrassment. Yes. And that nobody got hurt. It just seemed pointless to do that. Why would one do that? That's not the only reason why it's such a wonderful book. I think it's sort of so life-enhancing and joyous and irreverent and anarchic and and just kind of think qualities that I've forgotten existed in humour. I mean, it's old-fashioned in that sense. It's the old sense of humour I remember. People yes. just taking... You, I mean, we're not taking the piss, but you're, ta you're taking the piss out of yourself quite a lot of the time, obviously. Yeah, I think it's, taking oneself seriously is probably the, is, is the worst sin. actually anybody can have. And I think it also makes life so much duller. Because I think if I could have been given the gift of a happy disposition, I can't think of any greater gift. I sadly don't have a sort of totally happy disposition because I have, as all of us do, you know, dark moods when I murder people and that sort of thing. I'm desperately trying to get over that. And a happy disposition is, is a wonderful thing. But I think the second best thing you can have is a, an idea of your own ridiculousness. And I think when terrible things happen or things go horribly wrong, when you find yourself in the middle of a sort of, an incident, as it were, I suddenly found quite young that if I engaged with it and thought about what I'd think about it later, it suddenly became almost enjoyable. And so I would unfortunately get, you know, I'd be standing in front of a, a master brandishing a cane and using incredibly pompous language. And I'd be thinking of, of, of how I would tell the story later yes. and actually start to laugh, yes. which was, of course, the last thing you really want to do with a person. Yes, but you got addicted to the storytelling, didn't you? The the ability to um, yes. give create a laugh, raise a laugh. Yes. 
I mean, it is very addictive, but I was never brave enough to do it sort of on stage. That's something I really couldn't cope with at all. And I think, you know, the bravest people in the world are people who get up on a stage and make us laugh. And things are very funny. We all know what it's like to be at a funeral and get the giggles. You know, if you're predisposed, as I am, to laugh, the more serious things are, to have a sort of awful knee-jerk reaction that, that makes me more predisposed to, to giggles than anything else. And you find yourself with somebody else you know to be predisposed to those. It's almost the most wonderful situation where, you know, the anticipation is so great you can't catch their eye that it's a wonderful thing. And anything that, that gives people that much pleasure, and this is a dead person's expense, it must be said, so they're not <laughs> going to mind. And normally the people whose funerals I go to are people who've been great friends and been able to take a joke anyway. Yes. That, that you sort of want that to happen. I would love people to roar with laughter at my funeral. You know, when my mother died, who really didn't laugh at anything, she was cremated. cremated. Exactly. And she ended up in a very small box, which we then, my sisters and I, took up to where her family are buried. And a hole had been dug for a, a, a coffin. So it was a huge hole. And in the bottom of the hole was this E.O.D. Sexton, leaning on his spade and what appeared to be the village idiot next door to him, who was obviously the sexton's, you know, sort of Psychic. right hand. Does sexton have a right hand man? I don't know. Mm. But he got out, he leapt out, leaving the unfortunate chap in there to whom I handed the... Casket. And he looked at it and he looked at me and he looked back at it. He said, she was very small when she died. And all of us, I mean, just completely... Crease apart from the vicar, obviously, whose job it is not to laugh at things like that. And we couldn't stop laughing. And he thought, you know, it was funny as well because he was predisposed to, to giggles. So he started roaring with laughter, which he didn't stop doing until we put this thing at the bottom. Never quite knew what to do with it, with it you know. So we sort of left it and we walked away. Um, but I still to this day look at it, you know, think of his face and, and laugh. So, so the, my last sort of thoughts of my, or I thought at the time of my mother, were her being the cause of riotous laughter amongst us all, which is rather nice, until it so happened about two weeks later, my cousin telephoned me and said, your mother is in my hole. <laughs> Not a thing you ever want to hear about your mother. She said, you buried your mother in my hole. So I said, I'm so sorry, what do you mean? She said, that's where I was going to be buried. And I said, well, there's plenty of room because she was just in this tiny box. Anyway, so in the end, she was so insistent, so angry, that my mother was to be moved two yards to the left so that my cousin could go in this hole. What I didn't realise, you then have to telephone or get in touch with the Home Office to exhume a body, even though it was by this time... Already you know, ash. ash. yeah. And the Church Council, Church of England, everything. Vicar, lots of pieces of paper signed, extremely expensive. We moved my mother again to a smaller hole. But about six months later, we got a letter from the Church Commission saying that the new high-speed railway <laughs> was going to go straight through the graveyard and that they were going to have at some stage to disinter all the bodies, all the coffins and things, and move them elsewhere which would have been a third time that's gone quiet for the moment i'm not sure whether even they're building it but if they do build it, it'll go through there and we'll have to get her up again all of this would make great television drama wouldn't it have you thought about writing the screenplay for this well i've got plenty of people in the family who could i wonder if it would have been so funny when i'm probably probably you tell me because these escapades and these accidents i mean you went you went to rolling drunk but you you drank a little bit didn't you you had a good time yes would your life have been so funny and worth recounting if you had been sober do you know it's a terribly good question because i've had i mean those are sort of uh young escapades mm. and i just felt that the sort of distance of time also meant that i could sort of disown them mm. <laughs> by saying that that you know another time another place yeah. another country I was young and drunk and whatever else. But I'm not drunk in all those by any stretch yeah. of imagination. And, and hungover is almost worse than drunk in some cases. I mean, many very, uh, you know, comical things have happened uh, since I gave up drinking. I mean, 23 years ago. I, mean, I don't think, you know, any 
they, they're just slightly different. Mm. And I think that, you know, I've, I've still lost things. I've still left things lying around. I've still gone to the wrong, wrong funeral. Yeah, you know, there are awkwardnesses that happen. Yeah. And one's much more aware of them. But one's likely to deal with them slightly better. What made you decide to give up drinking? In Many things. I, I don't think, I mean, I think unless you actually have a profound sort of Damascene moment when uh, somebody finds you bleeding heavily in a gutter and you realise that, you know, it's come to this rock bottom, as it were, um, it, it is always a succession of things. And mine were all sort of rock bottomettes. And I think, you know, as they always say, the first thing you have to do is, is admit to yourself that, you know, it's not a good thing. And I think if there was a seesaw of life and on one side is sort of good times and the other side is bad times, so, so long as the the booze fulcrum, as it were, is sort of up, mm. then things are fine. I think it's when it starts to go below level, uh, when it starts to impinge on work, family, mm. friends, all those things, mainly family, and I'd seen too many people suddenly go from successful, happy, married, father, mother, to absolute wipeout yeah. and unraveling very quickly mm. that I sort of began to spot it, but not as, as, not as objectively, obviously, as Louise spotted it. Mm. <laughs> when, you, when you're a sort, of, um, a sort of happy drunk and the drunk you get, the more outlandish you become, mm. It's in most people's interest to keep you that way. Mm. It just is. Yes. Because they don't want to lose, you know, the, the clown. They don't yeah. want to use, you know, to go, crikey almighty. And they always know you're going to go probably one step mm. further than they mm. would. <laughs> They're, happy They're to living see. vicariously. Yeah. That. yeah. Indeed. And I think, you know, drunks uh, or, you know, boozers, you believe each other's bullshit. You believe each other's rubbish. And you're all wonderful and whatever. And I think the, the, the fear for most people giving up drinking is that you're suddenly going to have a lonely life. All those wonderful, wonderful friends and yeah. people that you meet in clubs and mm. bars and whatever are going to suddenly not want to see you. And your friends are not going to want you to come stay. They won't come stay with you because you don't drink. And you think, oh, my God, what am I going to do on the way to here? And, you know, if I go and stay with these people, you, you only think about negatives. You think about the country you're going to being, you know, sort of somewhere ghastly rather than actually you're going to the south of France. And it is different. And ultimately, it's going to be a really nice place to be. And I think it's that kind of strange hiatus between the giving up and the acceptance of a, you know, a life without booze that's the really difficult transition because there's so much pulling you that way. And the good things don't seem so much like fun at the time. The good things of, of, of being a a good father, of being a good husband, of, of, of having a happy home life, of being able to do work much better, of always knowing you're actually going to be there when you say you're going to be and, and being in control, don't seem so attractive to begin with. Nothing like as attractive as standing on a bar singing, you know, Mammy or whatever it is, um, to the applause of hundreds of racks. Um, it was a wonderful voice you have. Really? Hmm. You know, these sort of conversations, as I say, sort of, you know, nice and uh, uplifting. But then very quickly, you do realise that the fear you had, or I used to have, for instance, of going to New York and going, oh, Christ, I've got a meeting at eight. You know, the night after I get there, that's going to be a shocker. And then, oh, God, I've got lunch with Fred. How am I going to get to that? I mean, literally planning one's life around, um, you know, the booze and the hangover and the, the headache and the whatever – suddenly evaporate and you start to think, well, you know, they'll say, eight o'clock, are you right with that? Yeah, fine. You know, and you think, God, I will be. And, you know, lunch and I'll lunch and I say, gosh, I must go. And you get things done. And suddenly I found myself being incredibly productive that very, very few friends left. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a proselytizer in any way for, for this. It just suited me and it suited lots of my friends. And it didn't dry up your creative juices at all. The, You're quite the opposite, fun enough. And you've described yourself, well, I'm describing you as a Renaissance man with uh, with interests in many, many different spheres. I think you described yourself more like having a, a brain like a a curiosity shop, didn't you? An, an, a, an attic, mm. lots of different interests, which 
you can put into your jewellery, right? Because it seems to tap into lots of different areas, mm. your literary, your historical mm. interests and your visual interests. Was that an obvious channel for you to go into jewellery design? It, it certainly wasn't an obvious one. It turned mm. out to be bizarrely the right one. I don't know how that sort of kismet ever worked. And I think lots of people could look back on their lives and say, I don't know how on earth I became, a, whatever it is, you know, but it sent, suited me very well. You know, I went to art school at the time when foundation courses were genuinely wonderful. And they also had a, a terrific bonus of making you try everything. And in many cases, people thought, well, I'm no good at what I thought I wanted to do. But there's something else I really am good at. And also, I really love photography. Or I really love whatever it is. So we did a bit of everything. And I, I absolutely loved it. And coming as I did from a all-boys school, to find myself one of eight boys and 120 girls who had all grown up together in you know, dual-sex schools and were comfortable with each other, finding myself you know, blush every time a girl came up to me and said, hello, what's your name? And I go, oh, <laughs> terrible. I mean, it really was terrible. And I'd arrived the first day at York Art School. I said to my father, what do you think one should wear first day at art school? You know, having he was a soldier. All my family was soldiers. He had no idea at all. He said, oh, it's all. Cousin Robin, what would he have worn to go to Cambridge at first? Uh, and I thought, oh, he'd wear a sort of tweed coat and some flannels. <laughs> <laughs> and a sort of you know, a violet shirt and a tie. So I thought I'd go one better and wear a tweed suit. My grandfather's tweed suit with a tie and a shirt and some you know, very highly polished brown shoes as we were in the country. So I fetched up the first day at art school to find 119 people wearing jeans and T-shirts, obviously. So I turned up looking like a prat. And we sat down, 120 of us, and, and the, the um, I can't remember what he was called, the dean, was he called the dean? Anyway, what he was called, of the art school came in, dressed like a day guard dance master. He had a beret and a sort of smock and a big long stick. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He was, he was channeling yeah. uh, a day guard painting. And he looked at us all and he went... Hello, everybody. And we went, hello, Dean. <laughs> I said, hello, Dean. <laughs> Echoed around the thing. And he said, we have a first year at York Art School. So I went, ooh. He said, we have an old Etonian in our midst. Would you like to stand up, Mr Fennell? <laughs> so I had to stand up in this tweed suit and once And everyone went, either said or mouthed, mouthed the word Pratt. <laughs> it's a sort of hum of Pratt. Oh. I sat down. How oh, humiliating. It was utterly humiliating. And the next day, I thought, what do I do now? Do I go in in jeans and a T-shirt? Mm. The T-shirt started saying something like, you know, I support country pursuits. <laughs> or do I just go for it and go in in uh, a big blues on shirt and velvet trousers and boots? And I, so I took the second route. Mm. I thought, I'm just going to have to weather this. Mm. I thought you were a prat, but now you're worse. But in the end, they were just terrific. They had yeah. such fun yeah. and learnt so much. Yeah. We just, you know, did we, everything, photography, etching. So I had no idea what I wanted to do. Mm. It confused me in a way even more. So I came to London to do, really to do portraiture. Couldn't get a likeness. Huge drawback if you want to be a portrait painter. And just started doing this and that. Erotic etchings, you know, bits of whatever it is. And then that came to an end. Get a job, yeah. Just not a clue what to do. Let's talk about your jewellery, actually, because mm. um, I love the open sesame rings, as I like to call them, the, the, the hidden secrets. Mm. And I love jewellery. We all love jewellery because it has a... If you're a storyteller, every piece of jewellery has a story. Most pieces of jewellery. It should do. should do. Best jewellery has Yeah, a I think it should. It was a Damascene moment when I walked into the workshop of the silversmiths that I went to work for, for no other reason they offered me a job. Literally no other reason, because it never occurred to me anybody would offer me a job. I had no idea any more than anybody else does how silver was made, mm. and that I assumed that sort of candlesticks arrived sort of ready formed from somewhere, as we do with so many things. I mean, I wouldn't know how any of these things around us, really. But when I went into the workshop after about two months and I saw everybody just having a brilliant time and sort of taking lumps of sore again, and then, you know, at the end, 
there was a candlestick. And even better, so many people were involved and nobody had the sort of, apart from a bit of age and experience, nobody had the upper hand on anybody else. No hierarchy. Everyone. No hierarchy. Yeah. And even the man who designed them, he wasn't known as a jury designer. Mm. He was known as Eric the Artist because he did drawings. And so I spent a bit of time with him, listening to Mantovani all day. He listened to Mantovani. And I, I could have actually shot myself. Any time Mantovani comes on now, I burst into tears, pretty much. But it was just wonderful seeing all this stuff being made. And just and everybody's so proud of it together. And when they finished it and it was polished and it sat there, you know, they didn't care that it was going to a house they would never see the inside of. It, and it was a sort of mini version of building a cathedral where thousands of people were involved. It, it was a collective of individuals, of individuality. So everybody having their little mark on it in a subtle way. But at the end, just saying, here is this thing we've all done. And it gave me a huge interest in a sort of, I guess, collective enterprise of being able to put together things. And when I started to design jewellery, I found that, that there was a way going to look at old jewellery and getting involved in Saxon and, and Roman and Etruscan and Egyptian jewellery. You found these stories that were quite extraordinary. Uh, and you find the way people look at jewellery in a museum, say, is totally different from the way they look at it in, in say, Bond Street or, you know, in Rue de la Paix, wherever it is. There, they're looking at it in one of two ways. One is a sort of, king hell, look at that. Jesus, that must be expensive or whatever it is. It's a sort of, in a sort of acquisitive way, but also in a sort of, it's a power thing, that sort of jewelry. And it has a place, obviously, has done for a thousand years, a billion years, crowns and scepters, but also big diamonds that a man gives a woman really is a sign of ownership and a sign of showing off. It's, it's power jewelry. And that big stuff, it, it, and what it elicits is this kind of kind of bloody hell, as it would if you went into Fort Knox and saw a room full of gold. The other end is the jewelry that everyone's always worn forever. In every, even the most sort of primitive and the, the poorest of cultures, people have worn adornment of some sort, men and women. And it's just, you know, in our makeup, so to do, to find something and make it into something you put in your head or you put in your ears or do whatever. Where that's been bastardised, it's lost all its kind of cultural and individual thought and also been made really expensive by the big brands who just make thousands of the same thing. But in the middle is this thing, if you go to, say, uh, you know, the, the British Museum and you see a Saxon ring or you see an Egyptian burial ring, whatever, people go, my God, look at this. It tells a story. Suddenly they think, who is wearing it? Who gave it to whom? The amount of emotion, the amount of, 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 of sentimentality that it creates is extraordinary. And I've always wanted to do that. You know, I feel the ring should be known by its wearer mm -hmm. as well as its maker. So, you know, it, it, it's Granny's brooch. It's Aunt Mary's ring. Mm -hmm. It's Fred's watch. These are things that people wore yeah. and become sort of imbued with them. And I think even more so when it's been made for them. I mean, the joy for me of sitting down with somebody who's got some sensitivity, some taste, some idea about what sort of thing they want, and making something, something. And, and going into detail yeah. about what they want on the sides, how yeah. they want it to be, what they would like, all these. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's an absolute joy. And then being able to have at, at sort of at my beck and call these unbelievable craftspeople. I mean, they really are, some of them just, in fact, one of them who's worked for me now for 30 years, more 30 odd years, um, is 80 next week. He first sat at a bench when he was 17, so he's been doing it for 63 years. He's a history of, you know, jewellery from the 60s. In the 60s, he was making those amazing Grima pieces, and he's still making pieces for me now. And my craftsman sign there works out, you know, they have a, we have a craftsman's thing on it if it's a one-off piece and whatever so it it lives from their hand but as well as the people that have helped them I mean, some of the rings will take 12 different craftsmen you know from enamelers and engravers uh, setters polishers, well, all those people but at the end they've had this as, as i said from the beginning they've made this mini cathedral they're all as proud of it as each other and i think one of the things that is really important to me apart from getting young people 
to get into this craft where I know a really satisfying and enjoyable life can be had is to educate people who have the wherewithal to commission things. Obviously, you know, it's in my interest to do so, but nonetheless, it's a thing that I'm very keen on to get people to understand what is possible, how to have things made. It seems extraordinary to me that if you have a great deal of money, you would just go out and buy a silver service rather than have one made. All the great jewellery was made to commission. It was made by great jewellers and great silversmiths and great craftspeople to... It's having the confidence in your own taste, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and I think that's what... One of the problems is that huge amounts of money that have been made over the last 20 years or so have been made very easily and very quickly mm. without giving people the chance to to learn and to understand the obligation they have to other people. You know, in the old days, if somebody produced a vast amount of money, it normally came through building a business and, and a slow process of enrichment mm. that involved lots and lots of other people. You needed the other people to create your wealth and you had to look after them and you had to be decent to them, otherwise it wouldn't happen. The people who get involved in the process become the best advertising for the piece because they talk about it. And I've watched you know, a dinner table where a 10-carat flawless diamond has been flaunted, as it were. And people's reaction, rather like a very, very, very expensive firework display, is, Christ, what did that cost? Mm. It isn't, Harry must love Jane very much. <laughs> it is, Harry must be... Loaded. King Loaded. Yeah. And he's gone out, he's gone to whoever is, you know, the flavour of the month, and said, on a 10-carat diamond, flawless, what's it going to cost? Bang. So he's proving more about himself than he is about her, and he's not really proving anything about his feelings towards her. If, on the other hand, at the same dinner party, a ring that we'd made, which was a magpie nest, um, with a stone that was the boy, they'd had two girls before and they'd, they'd just had a boy, and she didn't want a normal eternity ring. So it had his birthstone in the top and then diamonds around it, and it had two magpies either side, so four in all. And then when you opened it up, it was a nest, a little gold nest with four little magpie eggs in it, carved out of stone. And it was one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. So when she explained this and explained, you know, about the enamelling and explained about how it had been made and whatever around the table, every single person went, oh, my God, oh, look at that. Yeah, it, it was suddenly, it was yes. a, a thing, it was a moment. You know, the amount of emotion that, that, that people were affording this piece, mm. which probably cost mm. a tenth of, of, of this other thing, was in, incredibly gratifying because that's what I'm after. So at the grand old age of 70, what do you know now that you would tell your 21-year-old self? I suppose mainly to worry less. If only one had known that... 90% of the things one worried about were never going to come to pass and one was going to get out of it some way or the other, I wouldn't have worried so much. I wouldn't have worried about so much what people thought of me. Yes. I think we always do. We all have a somebody, in my case, uh, my great-aunt Dodie, who said that wonderful line, people who matter don't mind and people who mind don't matter. And if only I'd taken that more to heart... I think I'd have been less fraught. I think it's important that, that nothing is as important as you think it is. And you can turn things to your advantage or at least turn things that seem appalling round to something manageable fairly simply if you just quiet, calm deliberation rather than worry and panic. Yeah, and that is one of the benefits of getting older is literally letting things go. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, I've never really minded as much as I thought I did what people thought about me. Otherwise, mm. I probably wouldn't have behaved as I did. But now I just don't care at all. And are you an optimist or a pessimist about the state of the world? Do you think that all these changes are, are, are a force for good? I think I'm, I, I'm a pessimist about small things and I'm a huge optimist about big things in the same way as I'm hopeless in a small catastrophe but in a large one, I'm at my best. Still not very good, but I am at my best. 
So I think the world will keep on turning. I think things will change. I think we need to look at history to see how quickly empires vanish. We need to look at how things have changed so vastly. And that happens quicker. But, you know, other people's time will come and ours will recede. And I think we've lived at a fantastic time of peace, although you know there have been wars going on everywhere. The peace in the Western Europe has been astonishing at a time of growth, at a time of, of, of uh, relative wealth for most people. I don't believe we've used it well enough. I really don't. I think we could have done far more with the resources we had. We could have fed people better. We could have taken the angst out of more people's lives. And I think we could have shared things much more evenly and better. But I think we will. And I think the crises that are coming will demand that we do do that and that we behave better and more responsibly and with more decency. And I think, you know, if I could look at anything that has disappointed me in my lifetime, it's been the denuding of decency, of, of, of common decency, of, of, of the way we treat each other, of the, the mad kind of battle for money. And, and suddenly seeing money become as it were, the god of achievement, rather than productivity, rather than leading a good and decent life, is this idea of, of accruing great wealth. And fame and wealth, which we all know, are two things more likely to blight a life than anything else, still appear to be this trophy that everybody is, is, is seeking. And, and I hope that will recede. And I think my children's generation far less money orientated and their aspirations are far more towards creation and decency and having a good life uh, and enjoying their family and friends. Well, I raise my glass of water to that. Mm. Thank you so much. If you've enjoyed today's show, you can hear more episodes by clicking follow wherever you're listening to this or simply searching The Third Act on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. And if you think your friends would love to listen, please tell them about us. This episode was produced by Pete Norton and Holly Fisher and made possible by Orion's, luxurious residences that are redefining later living in the heart of Chelsea. I'm Catherine Fairweather, and I can't wait to join you next week for another episode of The Third Act. The Third Act.